Welcome to the second episode of our Let's Talk About 5G monetization series, which will focus on flexible service creation and innovation, a topic that is so vital to communication service providers in the 5G era. And we have a great lineup of speakers from across the industry to talk about these very important developments. So settle in for some great insights from our industry expert presenters. But first, let's remind ourselves about the initial programme. In the first episode in the Let's Talk About 5G monetization series, we looked at the impact of 5G on industry partnerships and ecosystem engagements, focusing in particular on BSS system developments and what they mean for key issues such as charging policies, co-creation within the ecosystem, the monetization of new services opportunities such as slicing and a lot more. So let's find out who's on our first panel discussion. Helena Ola, Head of BSS Product Development Unit at Ericsson, returns to discuss flexible service creation and innovation. Helena, great to have you back. Also here with us today is Ida Laspiza, Head of Products and Production Services at Telia Company and Mark Newman, Chief Analyst at the TM Forum. Welcome to all of you and thanks for joining us today. Now, this is the first of two panel discussions in this programme. Later on, we'll be hearing from Singtel and Ericsson. But before we dive into today's key topic, let's take a quick look back at one of the elements from the first programme on ecosystem developments, and that is our service provider poll. We asked service provider viewers from that first episode, how do you rate your BSS readiness to capitalize on 5G opportunities with ecosystem partners? So let's take a look at the results. Is anybody surprised to see that none of the CSP respondents feel like they are fully ready for action? Uh, Helena, uh, do these results tie in with what you're seeing in the market? I think the poll result is, uh absolutely uh, resonating well with my own experience so far in this journey because it's not only about what the CSPs are actually learning and feeling it's the, the collaboration with the vendors as well like us for instance what we can do together what are the capabilities we are exposing and then from a CSP perspective how do we best monetize it for them okay great thanks Helena and uh, uh... Ida, do these results uh, tie, in, tie in with what you're seeing in the market at all and your experience? I, I would say that uh, the, the, to get ready for 5G monetization is a journey that uh, needs uh, changes all over from the network to the OSS and to the BSS. So it's a matter of also sequencing the transformation activities required. So the good news is that we know what to do uh, and we are all in the process, I guess, to uh, execute on those plans. Okay, thanks, Ida, and uh, and and Mark. Uh, I'm sure that you know we're at the beginning of a of a very long journey in terms of 5G. So, do, does this seem like the, the the kind of results that you would expect from this kind of poll? I spoke to a large number of CIOs, chief architects, um, in recent months, and it's something that's weighing heavily upon them. They know they need to upgrade, modernize their enterprise BSS systems. Uh, they just need to decide just how big that program is going to be. Okay, and we also have a poll to accompany this episode as well, and you can see it just below this video window. So vote at your leisure. Uh, let's turn now to the main topic for today, and that is flexible service creation and innovation. Uh, we talk a lot about 5G as a platform uh, with more programmability in the network than ever before. And 5G also demands software platforms with tight interlinking of BSS, OSS and the network for flexible service creation. Uh, but platform is a term that can mean many things to different people. Uh, so let's start by finding out what it means for each of today's guests. Traditionally, platforms includes hardware, it's storage, middleware, OS, everything. But if you look at this from an application point of view, OSS, BSS functions, they need to have a, a better alignment on the common base of the functionality. It needs to be more flexible to enable the launch of new services and accommodate for scale as well, which means we, we see a trend of more configuration over customization. 
So for me, the, the platform approach is such, um, we, we need to have a flexible service creation environment of the applications in order to have the fast product setup and uh, activation process of the same. Thanks, Helena. And uh, uh, Ida, what does the term platform mean to you? Yeah, it's, it ties very well with what Helena just said. Uh, we, um, as Telia, we operate in six different countries, so in the Nordic and Baltics. Uh, and uh, what we have decided was to uh, basically create a target architecture. So for us, a platform is uh, a, a very well-defined target architecture with flexible applications, uh, fully decoupled with uh, TMF uh, open APIs. And those uh, uh, applications are uh, to be uh, configured and uh, deployed in all the six countries uh, we, we operate. So it's uh, about having a common set of applications uh, fully available to the, all the countries, developed once uh, and uh, deploy six times. So that's uh, the way we are operating at the moment. Okay, that makes a lot of sense, of course. Uh, and, and Mark, the term platform, uh, this must crop up over and over for you. Um, increasingly, how, how I like to talk about this is when we think about how telecoms operators can evolve their business in the future. Today, they're connectivity businesses. Uh, maybe they can grow that connectivity business a little by providing more customized connectivity. Um, if we look at the most ambitious telecoms operators, they might be looking to develop end-to-end -end services in specific areas. But, but between that connectivity role and the end-to-end -end solutions role, we see platforms and telcos either managing and running their own platforms or participating in other platforms. All of this sounds like a, a very big shift from the siloed legacy architectures of the past. Um, so how does this look from the perspective of, of the, the shift from legacy to these new platforms? The architectures within OSS, BSS are being matured and also now uh, in transformation. So this is happening to enable flexibility and agility of the architectures. Um, but if I want to dive into a certain topic, that is the open APIs, uh, this is to enable ourselves to have better and more flexible connection points to the OSS BSS systems. And this is uh, also a key enabler uh, for us to become more um, part of the business ecosystem then. And we are focusing on, on the B2B capabilities. And that is not only in, in the architecture, but if you look into a, a capability point of view, it's the uh, the catalog management and the billing services and uh, partner management, everything is uh, underpinned by the cloud native principles. And uh, that is also a big change. Okay, uh, thanks, Helena. And uh, Ida, from a CSP perspective, how does this uh, shift, this migration from legacy architectures look to you? Yes, so we, we do have uh, at the moment, uh, uh, as I said, operating in six different countries. We have had in the past uh, at least uh, 12 different ways of uh, creating services and products towards our customers, uh, usually divided between B2B to B2, from B2C or mobile from fixed. And uh, this, of course, has created a um, lengthy process uh, to, uh, and time to market uh, delays. So now with this approach of having a common target architecture and common application across, uh, uh, we uh, basically um, aim to uh, reduce time to market and, of course, internal uh, uh, costs uh, for uh, deploying the same pro common products and common processes across the different uh, countries we operate on. This shift away from legacy architectures, I mean, this is absolutely essential uh, over time for all CSPs, I'm sure. And this is central to what uh, my colleagues at TM Forum are engaged in, and we have a reference architecture called the Open Digital Architecture. And this is a blueprint, if you like, for um, how, how operators should evolve from their current legacy systems uh, into more open, flexible, modular, component-based architectures, all interlinking with, uh, with open APIs. Uh, and, uh, and I think the there's unanimous support for that evolution into these open flexible systems. So uh, what about this route forward? Um, how can the CSPs manage service exposure to exploit the network uh, and 
at the same time secure a return on their investment in the network uh, over the long term? So for me, it's the balance of being open enough to uh, allow uh, other uh, network uh, elements to uh, access uh, our capabilities. Uh, and that is key to actually have this balance and the flexibility implemented to be able to launch new services for the CSPs. Yeah, there are different aspects into this uh, service exposure. We're looking into uh, all of them uh, from uh, basically exposing uh, through open APIs uh, and out to automate internally the way we work. So automate the processes uh, and also, of course, uh, um, also expose our cap network capabilities and service capabilities to uh, external partners and customers uh, uh, for uh, uh, to explore new business models. Okay, so a lot of economic possibilities there. Uh, and Mark, do you see a, a clear path to a return on investment from these new generation BSS deployments? So uh, do I see a, a clear path? I, I see a path. It's not, uh, it's not altogether clear. I mean, I, I think the starting point here is that uh, telecom operators rightly believe that they need to give the right connectivity experience to their customers and to their partners, um, and uh, and that's fundamentally important. We're moving into an era where connectivity is supporting applications rather than supporting specific devices or buildings, for example. Now, of course, you know, one of the big opportunities here is in the the B two B, the enterprise sector. Um, so, what about service level agreement management? Uh, how do you see this playing out as enterprises embrace the new value that 5G can bring to their businesses? This becomes pretty complicated when you're talking about providing SLAs potentially for each individual customer, uh, and those SLA, SLAs need to be uh, they need to be managed. Um, uh, we're talking about you know, service assurance has moved to the top of the agenda for many telcos now, and it's pretty complex. And I think in reality, most operators now realize you need to have a fairly high degree of automation to manage that complexity. It's going to be beyond us if we don't automate. And the SLAs, I want to comment one more thing then. I think Mark is uh, spot on there. They need to be configurable. And that means that they will be, be open for differences between uh, different customers then. And that is then with server level specifications, what we are focusing on to make them, uh, the ability to have them configurable. Now, Ida, based on your experience, uh, do you have uh, anything that you can share, any lessons learned uh, from what you've been doing at uh, Telia? Uh, what would you recommend that other CSPs focus on most and keep front of mind in terms of 5G monetization? In our case, as I said, we are six countries, so we have uh, uh, also that type of um, uh, complexity to handle. But uh, uh, for me, what is key is uh, top level, top management commitment uh, and a strict governance, set clear goals and make sure that we follow up uh, uh, on those goals uh, continuously because it, it's going to be a, a few years journey. Uh, and of course, create the right partnerships and create a strong relationship with the partners. Ericsson, one of those for the BSS and OSS, but we also have some transformation partners uh, uh, that are helping us along the way. So create a strict governance uh, and uh, uh, have the right partners with uh, helping us along the way. Uh, uh, Helena, how do you make this happen? How can you help? Uh, how do you ensure you are building more flexibility into the BSS systems that the CSPs will use? Yeah, I can just say we, we're, it's happening now, right? So we are working on, on many things, but the uh, to enable the flexibility means that we actually need to change how we implement software. Uh, we need to go for uh, modules rather than uh, monolithic uh, software system uh, sizes, right? The external integration uh, points and uh, the open APIs are, are where we are also focusing to have that supported uh, from our products. I also prefer that we do the ways of working definition together with our customers because that is, uh, if you look from a pipeline perspective, this is exactly what is needed. And we have many good cases where we work close with customers to actually ensure that type of uh, uh, position is uh, realized. And uh, of course, uh, Team Forum is uh, helping a lot with uh, this uh, wider industry perspective. And there, you heard a, 
and Marco already presenting a lot of those insights. Okay, thanks everybody. Um, so we've also received some very uh, quick fire questions from the Telecom TV community. Uh, so let's check out uh, a few of these. Uh, the first question we have is, uh, is configuration price and quotation or CPQ available from your business support system or BSS? So Helena, this sounds like a question for you. Absolutely. What you're talking about is a catalog driven architecture. So the answer is yes. And also that with the configuration over customization as a lead theme. Great. Thank you, Helena. Uh, the next question we have is, will the Ericsson 5G BSS be more platform centric? Uh, so uh, we've heard a bit about that already today, but Helena, let's uh, come to you on that. Yeah, the platform is uh, in the in the center and optimize, automate and reuse uh, all the features and components that are uh, common across the board. That is the platform. So, yes, we have adopted uh, um, a catalog driven uh, type of architecture. So, yes, definitely we see that we have chosen Ericsson as a partner for both BSS and OSS. So we definitely see the, the new uh, BSS uh, ready for that. Okay, next question from our audience. In your opinion, which network domain will be the potential bottleneck for the network slicing use case implementations? Hmm, yes, uh, good question, I must say. Excellent. And Ray, my job is to prevent bottlenecks, actually. That's what I do every day, right? So uh, just to answer the question, I would see that one key element is that the order management, the OSS and BSS functions must work together seamlessly to actually enable this. So that would be my prime objective to make sure that's a smooth uh, journey. As Elena said, we need to avoid those bottlenecks. So it, it is um, a lot required, both from the network and IT uh, BSS and OSS systems to be ready for network slicing. So what we need to make sure is that we have uh, uh, clear plans and a clear sequencing of the activities that needs to be done and avoid those bottlenecks. Next question here, are CSPs ready for the marketplace? economy a, a critical question uh mark what do you think are, are, are they ready to embrace this new approach to the market i think they're learning very quickly and i think marketplaces uh began to be a major theme in 2021 uh, and i think telcos are working out precisely what they mean by marketplace is it our marketplace or someone else's marketplace What's the difference between a portal and a marketplace? So I think telcos are enthusiastically looking at marketplace. They're just trying to work out precisely what their strategy is. And, uh, and for example, the relationship with developers, which is going to be a big part, I think, of marketplace strategies. Okay, another question from our audience. Um, uh, and a, uh, a very topical one comes up quite a lot. Uh, should all 5G BSS systems run in the public cloud? So technically, there is uh, no reason why uh, not only BSS, uh, uh, but uh, almost everything we do in at least in the in the IT space it should be in the public cloud, and and that's our strategy as well. What prevents us to to go public clouds uh, sometimes is the type of um, data we're carrying on. So some of that uh, is. Uh, deemed to be sensitive from a regulatory, security and legal perspective. Uh, in those cases, we are obliged to, to actually run on our private cloud. But other than that, uh, private cloud is, uh, uh, public cloud is the right place to be. Yeah, I think uh, like Ida says, it's, uh, it's uh, maybe not uh, all in one, but uh, we believe in the providing a choice. So if the customer wants to, uh, running a public cloud, it should not uh, be stopping them uh, that the application cannot. So we are absolutely focusing on, on both. Uh, and uh, as he just said as well, the security and the compliance processes need to be secured from the business perspective, but the technology as such should not be blocking. Yeah. Okay. Oh, well, good to have the option for the CSPs, of course, uh, for whichever way they want to go. Um, and then uh, our final question today from our audience. Uh, what impacts do you think that 5G uh, BSS will have on CSP entertainment strategies around uh, the provision of TV services and streaming services uh, by telecoms operators? I think we've already seen that telco is extremely important partners to these video platforms. Uh, as video platforms start to grow, telcos become more important as partners. 
Um, uh, I think in the 5G era, particularly this discussion we're having around BSS, OSS, there's an interesting discussion to be had around whether telcos can help uh, some of those video platforms to uh, to, to better monetize their own content by, by looking at a sort of long tail of users and different maybe pricing uh, models and approaches that those platforms can use for reaching uh, for reaching other customers beyond their basic subscription services. Okay, great to hear. Thanks very much. And thank you very much to all of our panelists, Helena, Ida, Mark. Uh, a great discussion on what is a very important topic. Now, this brings us to our second discussion for today. So at this point, I will hand over to my Telecom TV colleague, Guy Daniels. Guy, over to you. Thanks, Ray. So to continue our focus on flexible service creation and innovation and how we monetize 5G, I'm now joined by Cheng Chunsi, who is Vice President of Strategy and Transformation at Singtel, and Seda Dolan, who is Head of BSS Sales, Sales and Readiness and Sales Support at Ericsson. Hello and good to see both of you. Thanks so much for taking part in our discussion today. Ching Soon, let me start by asking you, how does Sintel's 5G go-to-market strategy impact your role and remit? Yeah, Sintel being the Southeast Asia largest telco and a market leader in Singapore, we, we are leading in every way we can. For example, we have developed the first 5G standalone network in Singapore, but it is not just about being first in the deployment of the 5G network but also developing an ecosystem to facilitate 5G innovation to create new values that 5G capabilities present. And, and this value creation is no longer just formulating price plan and SIM cards bundles. It is also about a total solution-based approach that needs ideation and effort to explore. First, we want to be ahead in the advanced 5G connectivity, hence, the first to deploy 5G SA in Singapore. Next is to continue our transformation towards a digital telco. We want a new value creation beyond connectivity business. Hence, leveraging all available technologies and collaborating with all partners that we can find is important to build our ecosystem and use cases. So for example, we are learning new technologies like service orchestration, network slicing, and AI. We are partnering the local academic institutions, and we fund 5G innovation facilities in Singapore. Now, you spoke of your 5G standalone network there. So which 5G SA-related use cases are you most excited about from a monetization perspective for you know, today uh, and also the longer term? The various industry verticals we have all heard about for example, the transport and the healthcare sectors, they all have the potential to be monetized and do well. We will see these implementations with various degree of success in time to come. In Singapore, applying 5G and digitalization on our public services is a big opportunity. We have a very strong, we have very strong support from our government agencies to put Singapore at the forefront in the global race of smart cities. Uh, we are having 5G technical trials with them right now. And in Australia, Optus has launched its living network, a network that comes alive and we empower our customer to switch on and off a collection of network features in my Optus app. And it's all supercharged by Optus 5G network. And Chen Chun, when it comes to monetization, what are the new 5G challenges and how are you overcoming these? I'm excited and upbeat about creating new values. And I strongly believe that 5G will be the global and key digital enabler for the digitalization of the various corporates and industries. The collaboration and partnership with these corporates to go through the ideation process, it's our approach. And it will not be a one-time effort, but a journey where use cases will be allowed to evolve over time. To overcome all this, building the 5G ecosystem and the software capabilities within Singtel are what we are doing instead of building a specific solution. 
Great. Well, let me bring Sedo into the conversation now. Um, how are you helping your telco partners here? What What are the new 5G challenges associated with monetization and how are you helping them overcome these? In this new era, the pace of change is expected to accelerate even more. As we are collaborating with Singtel, the service providers need to be prepared, operating under the conditions of severe uncertainty, support agile service creation, dynamic orchestration of their services and their partner services, and support differentiated monetization models via configuration. Now, we're seeing that 5G demands platforms with tight interworking of, of BSS and OSS, and the network for flexible service creation in product catalog and on ordering through activation processes. So, Seda, what's your approach here? Service exposure and customer empowerment are the focus points for being a successful platform provider. And to achieve this, a Singtel embrace, there is a need to develop flexible, intelligent, and holistic capabilities across the network and IT stacks to deliver truly seamless customer experience. Let me give you an example. Ericsson ordering and orchestration management solution makes this possible by transforming the traditional siloed service ordering and fulfillment process into a dynamic and trans service enablement. Within Singtel, we collaborate to build network IT platforms. I have an IT capability within networks and we adopt open standards like TMF, open APIs and ODA across IT and networks engineering for better alignment and tighter interworking. Thanks, Chen Jun. Uh, and can I also ask you, how are you approaching network slicing, especially with regards to monetization and ordering and activation? The value of network slicing must be built on real corporates and consumer use cases. There must also be value creation to back up their willingness to pay. Hence, pioneering trials and ideation with various corporate partners in digitalizing their industries and processes are important for them to recognize these values. So the BSS platform should evolve to deliver the customer experience around the ordering and activation of network slices through digital channels. They need to have the ability to handle B2B2X partnership models with catalog-driven architecture and flexible order management. And modernization of billing is required to support the advanced partnership models with real-time capabilities. And Seda, you just mentioned partnerships there. How are you approaching partner collaboration at Singtel and ensuring that innovation can thrive? Innovation is all about continuous ideation and exploration. I mean, Chan Chun has expressed in the introduction about the 5G Garage Initiative, which we are continuously learning side by side with Singtel, but also with other leading service providers, exploring to support the creation, launching and management of new 5G services. I would say in general terms, we partner everyone who can add value to our ideation and value creation process. They can be the IT arm of the various corporates, the leading telcos, the GSMA, and of course, we have our 5G technology vendor. So in Singapore, we partner Ericsson as an example, and not forgetting the cloud providers and all relevant ASPs, but they are important partners too. And finally, Chen Xu, what does all this mean for BSS Evolution? What's next for Singtel? The BSS has to evolve. The order to activation has to be real time. The network features has to be consumed as a service, which means all of this must be provided via real time APIs. I think we have identified the pieces or the various ingredients of success. What we need to do next is to pull all of them together. And it's not just about the 5G connectivity, the edge, the service orchestration that we have been talking about, but also the BSS as the critical component to form the full digital stack for success. Thank you, Chen Chun. And with that, we have to draw our discussion to a close. Thank you both very much for participating and sharing your views. Now back to Ray. Okay, great discussion there from Singtel's Cheng Chun and Seda from Ericsson. And this brings us towards the end of our program, but there's just time for me to remind you about our new poll, in which we're asking CSP respondents, what is your priority for improvements at the platform level? Please do vote now. 
And that does bring us to the end of today's Let's Talk About 5G monetization program, which was focused on flexible service creation and innovation. Thanks very much for joining us and goodbye. Today I will be sharing some insights from our exciting first uh, carrier full stack deployment of the Ericsson digital experience platform and charging system in support of our prepaid subscriber base of Telstra. Telstra offers a full range of communication services and digital services to our domestic and global customers in both retail and wholesale markets. Our global operations have presence in Europe, North America and Asia. In Australia, we provide approximately 18.3 million retail mobile services, 3.7 million retail fixed bundles and standalone data services, and 1.4 million voice-only standalone services. So the ask that we received was to find a way to significantly accelerate the transformation program, especially around the prepaid delivery. That meant we were bringing it forward, so both Telstra and Ericsson needed to be very much joined at the hip with our delivery and solutioning. We had to quickly form a team um, and bring in the best resources we could find from across the world and from across Ericsson. That was probably one of the most amazing experiences for me, as it was not very often that you actually get that level of uh, direct access to a PDU to, to work with some of the brightest minds in the industry. One of the other things that was a, a great change, I suppose, on the, in the how, was that we did have a much larger focus on COCD um, and being able to track that code progression all the way from the PDU through to Telstra's labs, through our multiple lab environments into a, a system test environment and then into production. And then ultimately, our measure of success was our sprint-based showcases to ensure that we were still keeping track. The DXP and um, charging system architecture was actually quite a great fit for us. It allowed us to create a hybrid architecture that continued to meet the digitization principles we had set ourselves. The predominantly microservice design of DXP fitted well with our um, digitization um, principles and methods of delivery. And it meant that you know we, we had the opportunity to continually provide a, a bit of an abstraction layer and an integration pathway using APIs. Put simply, the DXP and the, the charging system provided all the, the foundational pieces of uh, capability that we needed to, to really offer that prepaid service. We effectively shadowed um, our existing architecture and allowed us to implement DXP in a way that joined into our uh, existing capabilities around our service order management, our network as a service down the bottom there, and our front end for our customers. One of the, the key benefits that we saw was the ability to integrate DXP with that CSR console and to ensure that things like you know, order status and order updates and things were made um, possible by integrating to our end-to-end -end order visibility capability, the EOV. The catalog driven design extends its way all the way down into the charging system and that's really where the, the benefits come from so the ability to define charging templates that can then be brought up into the catalog and allow us to create as many different product offer instances as we like but from that single base template really gives us some speed and some flexibility with how we can take different product offers to market and under different plans without having to do a lot of rework and one of the most exciting things for me is seeing the product offer qualification capabilities extend through to those channels that are shown up the top there from that one change in the Ericsson Catalog Manager. We no longer have to line up you know, multiple catalog instances, even though they were mini catalogs. And I think that's going to be a great improvement in the speed to market that we have to react to, uh, you know, repricing or changing the capabilities and inclusions for customers. We are also continuing on our agile journey and operating and working with Ericsson to make sure that we can get our next range of uh, capability out for the MVP too. And we're looking really to exercise and leverage the value of that catalog lead design so that we can see how quickly we can actually react to market and show the benefit back to the, the business. We are contemplating handing the keys of the offer manager, one of the, the new UIs for the uh, Ericsson Catalog Manager to our product managers. That is, after all, what it was designed to do. Uh, it's quite an intuitive user interface for, for doing product design. It's going to be quite a, an empowering thing for our product teams to be able to eventually take on that functionality themselves, something that classically involved engaging our, our network and IT teams to actually deliver on.